So, as uh, Stu explained, uh, we've been working on a number of projects related to the use of technology in reading, writing, and learning. And uh, I understand you're having your final presentations in a couple of weeks, and Kier will be presenting uh, more on our current project related to writing. So, to balance that out, I thought I would uh, talk, discuss one of our very interesting projects related to reading. But I'll also, uh, at the end of the talk, kind of give you a survey of, of some of the various projects uh, that we're working on. And I, I hope this will also uh, give you uh, some sense of you know, how research projects are developed, where they come from, what goes into their planning. I mean, uh, this particular one, it all began when I was reading the New York Times. And there was an article about the effects of digital reading. And one of the commenters mentioned this software program that they thought was very interesting called Live Inc. And then, since I'm interested in digital reading, I went online and I found Live Inc. And I read a lot of the prior studies about it and interacted with the people who developed it. So it's uh, a little bit of serendipity involved in the uh, development of research. So again, the background to this is just how much reading, I mean, most of you are so young that you're probably not even aware of the transition, but certainly when I was a college student, we didn't have any of these uh, devices for reading. And uh, they also say that uh, young people uh, enjoy reading using digital media very much, as is conveyed by uh, this cartoon, which says it's the only way he'll read a book, which is he has a webcam pointed to his book and he's <laughs> reading it on the screen. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of interesting questions, I uh, hinted at some of them, about how does this transform reading? Does it make it better or does it make it worse? Can any of you just think off the top of your head in some ways that reading digitally might be either better or worse, for example, for ch children in, than uh, reading in print? Just brainstorm any ideas you might have. Yes? Well, I mean, if kids have all of their books on one tablet in school, but they don't have to lug around so many. Okay, it certainly creates that kind of portability, even for health. I mean, there's issues about posture and carrying books. Other thoughts? Okay, don't need to carry too many books. That's a popular idea. Any any others? Environmental friendly. Environmental friendly. Okay, it's in, in some ways more environmental friendly, although that might be partially offset by the fact that people are purchasing a lot more electronic devices, but <laughs> using a lot more electricity, but in some ways it's more environmentally friendly. Okay, all those things are, are to consider. You know, in, as a professor of education, I'm particularly concerned with kind of the, the, the educational aspects, the psycholinguistic aspects, you know, what goes on in, in, in the reading process. Does it affect how students learn? And you might say, well, you know, it's the same content either way, but when content is presented in different ways, uh, it can have a big impact. Uh, one, to me, one possible uh, disadvantage, and we're looking at that in another study, has to do with distraction. So if you have a, you know, a, a, a physics test book compared to a physics app, you know, which, in which one you're using are you more likely to get distracted from and go off into Facebook or Twitter or this or that. So that, that's one feature. Of course, uh, there's a lot of other features uh, such as the you know the ability to uh, highlight, to search for things, to look at video, to do quizzes. So there's there's lots of different things, and in particular, uh, one of the things that I'm interested is in digital scaffolding. So the term scaffolding refers to if you think about construction, when you build a building, you have scaffolding outside, which kind of offers support for the building as you build it, and then you gradually take it away. And you can also think of scaffolding for learning, the kind of support structures that you can have to help people learn better, and then once they become more independent learners, you can take those away. 
So in, in digital reading, you can have things like glosses, where people click on words and they get taken to the definition or the translation or a picture or a video. Uh, you can have annotations. You can have kind of advanced organizers where they have some questions before they read or after they read that helps them memorize and learn things. So there's lots of possible things. But I'm going to talk about one today, which is, which is more far-reaching than that, which has to do with kind of the entire way that reading is structured, that we just take for granted. Uh, and to do so, uh, I'll take a, start with like a brief uh, five-minute walk through history. So uh, this is an example of a text, as it were, from about 4000 uh, BC uh, using uh, Sumerian logographs. And uh, this is an example of an alphabetic text, of course translated into English from Phoenician, but an example of what a text would look like about 2000 BC when there were no spaces between words and everything was written in consonants. Can you make out what that says, by the way? Okay, keep that in mind. <laughs> Well, then in about 1,000, about 1000 BC, they, uh, the Greeks added vowels, and that becomes a little bit easier to read. Probably most of you could figure out what that says, but you can't read it nearly as quickly as you could something written today. And then about 200 BC, uh, punctuation was added, such as commas. Uh, and then about 700 AD, uh, upper and lower case was mixed, which again, I think it's probably starting to become a little clear. And then a key change, change happened in about 900 AD, when spaces were inserted between words. And just look at the difference between how you know, fast and easily you can read that and, and read this. And somebody actually, a uh, historian of literacy, wrote an entire book about the, this change, the insertion of spaces between words, and the impact it had on literacy. It had an enormous impact on literacy, because before, and as I heard some of you doing, you kind of had to read out loud almost, either out loud or kind of softly to yourself to figure out what was going on. But uh, with spaces between words, uh, people could read silently and more quickly, and that helped gave rise to really the whole era of modern scholarship. And that was an important precursor uh, to the development of the printing press and the impact of the printing press. So that was a key juncture in, in the history of literacy. But since that date, uh, yes, typefaces have changed in this and that, but there hasn't been that much change in the basic block formatting of text. Well, the question is, is there a way that we could do it better? Well, there are limitations to block formatting. And the first one is, the human eye can only take in about nine or ten characters at a time. So what happens? When you see something like this, really, you're only reading about nine or ten characters at a time and uh, everything else is competing for attention. Uh, therefore, because of that, what they call regressions make up 20% of the eye movements in reading. Uh, when you get to the end of this, you're kind of leaping to the next one, and you're getting confused about where you are, and you're going back and forth. Uh, and. Uh, these regressions aren't, uh, regressions make up 20% of the eye movements in reading. That's why reading something with, I never know whether these are wide margins or narrow margins, I never know what to, how to describe this, but reading something like this is a lot harder than reading something like this. This exact same text, but uh, again, it goes back to the point that you can only take in a few characters at a time. So the more characters you have, the easier it is to get lost. But it's, it's not only the width, but it has to do with the grammatical structure, because these regressions, they're not arbitrary, but they basically take place at key syntactically confusing junctures. So again, when you're you know, going back to this, uh, 
when you're jumping every nine or ten things, if there's any place that's syntactically confusing, that's the part where you start to get uh, really confused. It's like if I said, you know, I threw the ball to Tom and Steve. Is it, did I throw the ball to Tom and Steve, or did I throw the ball to Tom and Steve took it next or something? And you get there, you're uncertain, and you know, you kind of jump back and forth. So basically, while you're reading, you're doing a lot of parsing of sentences. And people have done uh, uh, MRI studies to show that reading complex syntax involved is a lot more complicated in terms of brain activity uh, than reading simple syntax. And you might know, like uh, kids, for example, when they're learning to read, if they're bad readers, maybe they can decode each word but they kind of read like this and they, you know, they don't know how it all goes together. They don't understand like the, the, the syntactic and meaning structure. Now, when I'm speaking to you, I'm giving you all sorts of clues as to what the syntactic structure is. How, what kind of clues am I giving you? How am I giving you clues? Hand gestures. Hand gestures. What else? Voice modulation. Voice modulation, pauses, pitch, etc. So you kind of know when how the, the language is structured together. Now punctuation gives that a little bit of that in reading and writing, but not nearly as much. So you don't get as, as many cues. And that's one of the reasons why uh, you know many people can understand spoken speech better than written speech. Now there are ways though to communicate syntactic structure in writing. Uh, for example, uh, in, does anybody know what this is? That's a poem, except you would never see a poem written that way. Instead, you would see it written this way. So it's syntactically organized to give you more of a sense of the chunks of the sentence. Or perhaps even a more uh, relevant example to present in Cal IT2, a sample computer program. Now, which is easier to understand the syntax of? This or this? The first one or the second one? Second one. So all computer programs are written in a syntactic way so you can immediately see the structure which makes it a lot easier to figure out what's going on looking at this than looking at this. So somebody got the idea, and actually the person who got the idea, he's a, a fascinating guy. We didn't develop this here, somebody developed it elsewhere. His name is Randall Walker. He is a uh, medical researcher at Mayo Clinic on, in a different area, not having to do with reading or but he himself had very, very bad vision and still does. He's the kind of person who has to hold something really close to his face to read something. So all these problems were exacerbated for him. And he got the idea, you know, how could I make reading easier for me and potentially for other kids, other people too. So the question, the idea is, what if we took a paragraph like this and we changed it to that? Would it be any easier for people to read, to comprehend, to retain? Now this is a little bit of a trick question for all of us because the very fact that you're, you uh, graduated high school, you got into surf IT, got into a great university, you got into surf IT, you're probably highly proficient readers in English. But you know, those of you who have studied a foreign language, for example, I mean for me, you know, I can kind of read French, but if a passage in French was syntactically structured, I think I would be able to read it a lot better. And the other thing they found is that uh, when people read, they tend to focus on the relationship between the subject and the predicate. So that if they colorize the main verbs, that would also kind of provide some additional clues to guide their, their mind through. Now this is a very interesting idea in theory, but how did they make it practical? Well, they've been working on this for about 10 or 12 years, and they developed uh, a software program uh, called LiveInc uh, that uses natural language processing 
to take text in this format and to turn it into this format. Uh, it's done all automatically and uh, they've had to refine it over 10 or 12 years because it's not a simple task. Uh, you know, if you say something, uh, you know, usually like uh, a preposition usually starts a phrase like up the wall. But if you say I pick up, you know, it, up has to go with pick and not with the next phrase. So, uh, you know, these kinds of things are very complicated, but they spent more than 10 years working on it and they developed this program called Live Inc. So, uh, Live Inc. breaks up li uh, lines at phrase and clause boundaries, has shorter rows of text that fit into one or two eye fixation spans of about nine or ten characters. The cascading nature of it depicts the syntactic hierarchies, and the indentations guide the row from guide the eyes from row to row. So everything about it is carefully programmed. And they call this visual syntactic text forming. Now, uh, they have a, they have a, a software uh, program called ClipRead. They used to give it away for free, but now they charge like a few dollars a month. You can probably sample it for free. Where you can cut and paste uh, any, any digital text. <laughs> so you could go to a New York Times article, you could highlight it, click on it, and it would open up in Live Ink in another panel. Uh, within a few sec a couple of seconds it would be, the whole thing would be converted to this format and then you could just kind of scroll through it. Uh, more interestingly for our own research with K-12 students they're partnering with textbook companies and pre, excuse me, pre-formatting the entire textbook and then they create something like a little feather up on the top. You click on the feather and then another panel opens up. Well, they uh, have also conducted their own research on these things and they make some pretty bold claims. Uh, they claim that uh, when people, uh, they've taken college students and have them read in this format compared to all on the computer screen, this format compared to block formatting. They, and then given them tests afterwards, they compare, they claim that they comprehend more. Uh, they've done some, used eye tracking software, which is basically this little device that people wear on their eyes that looks at, measures where on the page people look at, uh, to demonstrate that in block text people read a lot more slowly. It has to do this with regressions I talked about before where their eyes move down more efficiently in, in visual syntactic text formatting, which leads to greater efficiency. Uh, they also claim that uh, when people, uh, kids read, like their history books, so they've done some studies where some kids have read their history book in this format, vis-a-vis -vis in the other format. Uh, they claim that they uh, do better on their history tests, which would indicate more retention of material and that they do better uh, on their final exam as well. So, uh, all their research on this, oh, uh, and then the other thing that's most, this is one of the things that's most interesting to me. They also claim that if uh, people read this way for an hour a week throughout the whole year, that they do better on their standardized reading tests even though those standardized reading tests are given in traditional block format. Now that seems sort of counterintuitive, right? Uh, but the idea, well, theoretically, you know, from a, a, a literacy researcher, there are some possible rationales for that. Because, you know, since syntactic, I mean, Research suggests that uh, knowledge of syntax is very highly correlated with reading ability. Uh, one of the things we find is that reading out loud to kids is one of the best ways to improve their reading proficiency. Why is that? When you read out loud to them, you're giving them the clues to how the sentence is supposed to be structured. So when they read sentences, when they see the same words, they understand the clusters and their eyes can move along more efficiently without getting lost. Well, perhaps the same thing is happening here. It's kind of like a reading out loud effect. Instead of reading out loud to a kid, they read it in syntactic formatting and maybe they're kind of absorbing the structures. 
Uh, and they also claim that the benefits have been especially good for English learners and that, that people suffer less eye strain doing this. Now, all of this, uh, the, the people who have done this research, the, the guy who's behind this, as I said, he's a, a medical researcher at Mayo Clinic. He's a pretty good researcher. But I will say that there are some imperfections in, in the research design. It wasn't all done by them. In some cases, it was done by kind of an enthusiastic doctoral student, uh, but under their guidance. But uh, the research design is pretty good, but it's it's far from perfect. So uh, it was, you know, what was like Ronald Reagan's famous statement about Gorbachev or something on nuclear arms, something like trust but verify. So we are doing uh, the largest independent study of live ink uh, that has yet been done because it's always important. You know, somebody wrote a, uh, it's a very interesting research paper. Uh, it was, I think it was published in a medical journal. It was something to the effect of, uh, you know, why, why most research is false. And uh, he claimed that uh, It's very, very difficult to replicate research findings, especially in the social sciences, but also in the medical sciences. And he came up with a lot of reasons why that's so, or more, more particularly, he came up with a lot of things that are correlated with the likelihood of false findings or exaggerated findings. One of them is that the researcher has a strong stake in the outcome. I mean, that's obvious. You know, another one is that uh, small sample sizes, which was also the case in some of these earlier studies. Another one is that the research questions are malleable. Like rather than starting with one research question that you look at, you kind of gather a lot of data and then, you know, look at it in lots of different ways to see if you can pick out an interesting finding. So, uh, for all those reasons, the whole question of rigor in educational research and rigor in social science research you know, is, is very, very important. So we're trying uh, to set up very rigorous studies. So uh, one of the key elements of, of uh, rigorous research and education in the social sciences is random assignment. So we, uh, which is very difficult often in school settings, so, for example, you know, we couldn't go to schools and say, okay, look for volunteers who wanted to do this. Let's, let's find teachers who want to do this. So we'll go to a school district and say, if you're interested in being part of our study, if you're interested in trying this out, you volunteer. We couldn't take 30 teachers who volunteered and then say we would compare them to 30 similar teachers in the district. Because they might seem similar, but the very fact that they volunteered to try something new suggests that they're probably different in some ways than those who didn't volunteer. So the way that we use random assignment in this study is we recruited volunteers. We got 48 volunteers to, 48 teachers to volunteer. And then we randomly assigned them. So half of them got to do the experiment and half don't. So the half that don't are the control group. So we're giving all the same quizzes and tests and reading measures to both groups. Uh, and uh, we're looking at uh, comprehension by having uh, uh, students read in the two formats and immediately take a quiz. We're looking at retention. So basically half the classes had their, their all the students in all 48 classes have laptops all the time because we also didn't want to say, okay, these 24 classes are going to get to use computers and these 24 aren't because that itself could have had a motivating effect on, on students. So all the kids use computers already in the classrooms. But half of them are using, uh, they had their books, social studies and English language arts books, converted to live ink, and half have not. And they're reading in their normal textbooks. We're looking at comprehension. We're looking at how they retain, for example, in their social studies tests. We're going to look at their end of the year proficiency tests, and again, compare it to the beginning of the year to see how much improvement. And do you know what this term means, heterogeneous effects? We want to see if the effects are uniform or if they're dif differential according to groups. Does this help low readers more than high readers, or English learners better than non-English learners, or 
or uh, special uh, kids in special education more. Uh, we don't have the final data. Uh, this is an interesting study that's going on in progress. Uh, but I found it so fascinating, it was one that I, I, I wanted to uh, present on. And uh, I also want to, uh, we did give very interesting feedback uh, from the teachers so far. Uh, they felt very positive about it. They were somewhat skeptical at first. But they felt that there was a lot of an anecdotal evidence from some other measures they're giving in class that their students are actually uh, uh, learning to read better, and especially kids uh, with special needs. I mean, there was one kid, again, who had a visual problem, who, uh, you know, who his mother told him, uh, the mother reported to the teacher that he came home and said, Mom, I can finally read like ordinary kids, or like other kids. So at least it, it seems, there seems to be having a positive effect, but there was actually one big problem with our, our implementation this year, which is that the Live Inc. version of the book that we produced had only the text. It didn't have any images in it, which turned out to be a big, big obstacle, especially for, we did it in both English language arts and social studies. Well, if you look at a social studies book, almost Three quarters of the content is graphs and charts and figures and this and this and that. And if they wanted to look at it, they had to like go back to their book and back and forth or this or that. So for our, our next grant, which we've already applied for for that, uh, it's more expensive because the creation of the book is a lot more expensive. But we want to create live science books that uh, for tablets uh, that uh, have all the images and the graphics and the visual content integrated in with the live ink and kids can sort of touch it and go back and forth. So I want to, in addition to this, I thought this was a really interesting study that I wanted to talk a few minutes about because everybody reads and so you might have an opinion on it. But, and I want to give you an overview of some of our other studies, but before I do that, I thought I'd just stop here and see if anybody has any comments or questions. The other thing is that we hope to do, we haven't done yet, is to test this in places like uh, Korea, Japan, and China. Uh, I spent last year on sabbatical in Japan, and I gave this presentation a few times, and a lot of the, 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 the professors and researchers and teachers there were really excited because they thought, especially when reading in a foreign language, it would be uh, really beneficial. Uh, and we're uh, under some discussions to do some big trials in Korea, because Korea, for example, is moving much faster than Japan or China to put uh, digital devices in the hands of all their students. So, comments, questions? Yes? Regarding those for the this method to prepare for Japan, is it only in the language English or is it translated to You know, in, in theory, this could be done in other languages, <laughs> but as I said, the people who developed it did, you know, 10 or 12 years of work to develop the, the English language parsing engine. And it hasn't been done. So when we're talking about doing it in, in Korea or Japan or China, those for uh, in English language classes. Uh, whether, you know, uh, I'm not familiar enough with the reading research in Asian languages to know the relationship of syntactic knowledge to reading ability. I mean, certainly in a language uh, like Chinese or perhaps Japanese that uh, uses a lot of uh, ideographic characters, I imagine the whole reading process would be quite different, and I don't know if this would translate to that or not. But, uh, so I guess in theory it could be done uh, to other languages, but nobody that I know has, has done that. Yes? Well, you know, uh, in, kids who are using this in school, they're using it kind of at most an hour a week out of like 20, you know, 10, 20 hours of reading. And not. So it's, it's not that this is replacing all the other reading they're doing. Uh, although we, we did have a couple of fourth grade children started to write their sentences that way. And the teacher said, no, no, no. Uh, but again, we're going to test that. But the claims from prior research is that when they went back to reading in block format, they actually increased their test scores more, even though the, the tests were given in block format. Now, is will we find the same thing? Ask me in a month. 
Uh, we were hoping to know by now because usually the California states, uh, the California standard tests usually come out in like the first week of August. But this year there was some kind of cheating scandal and they delayed the California standards test until the end of August. So hopefully in September we'll have the, uh, the answers to that. Other, other questions or comments? Curious, why did you pick fourth and sixth grade? Is that near the previous studies, or you know, uh, for a couple of reasons, we wanted uh, we wanted to do this in elementary school, and we wanted to work in schools where all the kids had laptops, and the school districts that we were partnering with, by coincidence, it was like fourth or sixth grade. Uh, the next study we want to do, uh, we're planning on doing in like middle school science. But I, I think, nobody knows for sure, but there is, a, there is a lower level for this. Because, you know, when kids' reading is too syntactically simple, like in kindergarten, first grade, or second grade, you know, it probably wouldn't work. Uh, their prior research has been done, I think, from about fourth grade up. Is there any differentiation um, for size of device, like if they're reading on a little thing or if they're reading on a laptop screen? You know, all the research which has been done before has been done on desktop computers. Uh, we're doing it on laptops this year. And, uh, you know, we hope to do future research with, with iPads. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it. Again, you can see how complicated you know research is. Uh, the nature of this research is that it has to be implemented in an entire class. You know, you can't have half the kids reading one way and half the kids reading the other way. Well, in social science research, n size is really important. The number of subjects you have is really important. But in our case, for this research, each class is basically counted, you know, as a unit. So, you know, even to do two-way comparisons, we need to have something like, you know, at least 30 classes. And when you start trying to do, you know, let's have, you know, one group do uh, different ways of reading, and one group do different types of devices, and one gets really, really complicated. But we're definitely going to do the next uh, research project. Now, uh, interestingly, uh, we were planning on doing a study with, we are thinking about doing a study with seven-inch Android tablets. I mean, for one reason, they're really cheap. Uh, has anybody used this new Google tablet? I'm looking forward to getting my hands on it. What's it called? The uh, Next or something? Huh? Nexus? Nexus, yeah. Uh, you know, that would be great. It's only $200. But when we actually, you know, from our previous study, finding that we needed to have all the image content and the text content, we decided to go with the 10-inch, uh, with the 9.7-inch and the iPad. So that was a grant we put in. But this could theoretically be used on, on iPhones or, or our smartphones. Other, other questions? Um, if this were to, say, become a new standard, digital reading, do you think it will replace printed reading in school? Well, there's two questions. Do I, think, do I think that this formatting will replace print reading? No. You know, we've been doing it that way for so many uh, hundreds of years. Uh, and I, I don't think that people are going to give up block formatting for some sort of syntactic scaffolding. I think this kind of, even if this kind of syntactic scaffolding works, I think it will be, for most people, it will be, it could be kind of a pedagogic tool that you could use, you know, an hour a week or something when kids are in school. Uh, for some adults who uh, find it you know, maybe second, uh, people reading in a foreign language or people with visual reading problems or something might prefer to read this way and read it all the time. But I don't think this formatting will replace block formatting. Now, the question whether I think that uh, digital reading will replace print reading, uh, absolutely. I mean, over the last 20 or 30 years, you know, we have basically gone through a transition from uh, writing on paper to writing on the screen. Almost any serious writing done uh, by academics, by scholars, by university students, by professionals, by business, pe people in business, 
is done digitally these days. There's just very, very little writing which is done. Uh, and that's a tra I mean, that transition happened in, in my lifetime. When I was a kid, that wasn't the case. Uh, we're really at the same, we're going, we're, we're starting to go through the, a similar process with reading. I mean, even, even five years ago, yes, people did a lot of, five or ten years ago, people did a lot of reading, like of websites and this and that, but books, magazines, newspapers, ten years ago, I would say close to 100% were read in print. And think about how much that's changed now. Uh, in the United States, I would say uh, of uh, independent leisure book reading by adults, I would guess about half of it is being is being done uh, in in uh, in digital devices as opposed to in print material, and that's in the space of over a, a few years. Certainly, um, magazines, newspapers, uh, etc. So uh, I think that it, I think that it will go that way, and uh, that's why I think it's important to do a lot of research on how can we make use of this transition to support uh, the reading and writing and learning process. Most of our most of my research and most of our research in the Department of Education is focusing on low performing learners. Because uh, in the United States, uh, the top students in the United States do as well as the top students around the world. But when the real educational problem, challenge in the United States, is we have so many low-performing students. And a lot of that has to do uh, with, uh, we have more poverty in the United States than in most other developed countries. Uh, we have a lot of immigration, uh, we have historical issues, so there's a whole lot of issues behind that, but we have huge gaps in our education system. And for that reason, we have, compared to like a lot of countries in, in Europe or in East Asia, we have a very high dropout rate, we have a lot of kids, we have a high illiteracy rate, we have a lot of kids who don't finish high school. So my own research and a lot of us in the School of Education is focused on how could we uh, better improve the educational process to reach uh, English language learners, uh, uh, kids of limited literacy, etc. And that's why we're focusing on these kinds of tools that we think have that potential. Other, other comments or questions on, on this? Last one, and then I'll go on to some other things. No, uh, but there, the question is, can, can this reading software sort of uh, keep track of your pronunciation and tell you whether it's correct or not? No, but there are other software programs which try to improve reading that way. Exactly how you said, kids read out loud and then it gives kids feedback on, uh, you know, the, uh, it records what they say and it gives kids feedback on the relationship of their uh, out loud reading to the way it's supposed to be read. And they also have similar software that's uh, for the purpose uh, not so much of teaching reading but also for teaching uh, speaking. So there's one software program. I'm also I'm the editor of a journal called Language Learning and Technology. So I'm focused uh, very broadly on the ways that technology can improve literacy but also can improve language learning. So there's a software program uh, where you basically watch movie clips and then you listen to a section of an American movie clip and then you repeat it. And then it shows you the kind of speech graph of the person who spoke in the movie and it shows how yours compares to it. So it gives you a visual representation. So lots of, lots of interesting research related to technology and language and literacy. Let me go on uh, to, and we can come back to further discussion of, of reading software. Let me go on to show you uh, some of the software, uh, other studies that we've been doing uh, to give you a sense of kind of the profile of what uh, a research profile on technology, literacy, and learning looks like. As Stu mentioned, we've done research uh, for a number of years in, in schools where all the kids have laptop computers. And I would summarize that research as uh, 
The main summary of that research is laptops make a good school better, but they don't make a bad school good. <laughs> In other words, if you're already focusing on writing and research and critical thinking and a teacher can really a teacher and students can really exploit a laptop because students can write and edit their work, they can go online and do research, they can use spreadsheets, they can, you know, do simulations, everything. On the other hand, if you have a school where both the teachers and students are wasting a lot of time and the teachers have very little control, well, there's no better tool for wasting time than a laptop connected to the internet. So this was research done. This was an interesting study. This was done in a very successful school district where they had a very uh, good writing curriculum reform. But it was only in the, we compared the two grades that the kids had laptop. All, they had the reform in all four grades. But the, they were given laptops as part of it in the fifth and sixth grades. And we compared, uh, the change in writing scores in the two grades with laptops to the to the two grades where they didn't have laptops. And in this particular district, uh, the scores went up in the two grades with laptops. But again, this was an example where it was laptops as part of uh, teacher training, professional development, a good curriculum, etc. But we've done this is one of many, many studies we've done looking at the differences between schools with laptops and schools without them. I've also, have any of you heard of the uh, One Laptop Per Child program? It was like Nicholas Negroponte's $100 laptop. I've also written some uh, things about that based on some research we've done in a couple of countries together with some colleagues. And in, in general, we found it to be very problematic because, you know, they were putting all the faith in the, handing out the computer itself rather than all the other contextual factors needed, such as electricity, internet <laughs> access, repairs. Okay, another research project, uh, we're looking at the effect of kind of computer mediated communication and uh, microblogging in the classroom. And uh, this was a study uh, done in a couple of classes. It was in a special school for English language learners and uh, all the kids uh, had laptops. And uh, they did this interesting reading activity uh, once a week, they would take, uh, now they had fairly small classes there, about 25 per class, as opposed to California where they have about, you know, 36 per class, so it was easier to do that there. But they would take the two classes together, I think these were uh, fifth grade students, they'd take two classes together. One student, one teacher would, would read out loud. I remember the day we visited the class, have any of you heard of the book Fast Food Nation? It's a book about how bad food is, how bad McDonald's food is, and this and that. Well, there's a, I forgot the title of it, but there's a similar book that was written, kind of targeted at elementary school students. Same content, but, you know. So one teacher would be reading out loud, and students had two, champ, two ways to participate. They could participate by raising their hand and commenting on the story, or they were using this microblogging tool called Cover It Live, and they could post their comment in writing. So was, you might have heard the phrase back channel, which you can refer to like Twitter and other things. They were trying to give a, a students a chance to you know, use computer media interaction to participate rather than to be distracted. And uh, we did a lot of, so you know, some of the studies before were looking at what happens in whole school districts. This study, we're looking at what goes on in classrooms. And I had one of my PhD students, Bin Bin Zhang, who did a lot of this analysis. We did a lot of interesting analysis. But one of the things she, she did was social network analysis to look at the interaction among students. Whoops. So, uh, uh, you know, we have the round of the girls, the squares of the boys, uh, the triangle is the teacher. And you can, all of these are students too, but you can see that they're isolated. And by isolated, it means that they might have discussed things, but they never directed any of their comments to each other. This software that we use called UCI Net, I think it's called, it was actually developed here at UCI. It's a free software program. It, uh, we set it up so that it used, took advantage of the at sign, you know, to, to show whether you were directing your comment to a particular person. So, uh, and the, the thickness of the ties indicate, you know, how many comments and the arrow, the direction. And so most of the interaction was from the teacher outward. And a lot of students were very isolated in the beginning of the, 
beginning of the year. At the end of the year, it looked completely different. Uh, there was much more uh, dense interaction of participation. Some of the nodes were almost as big as the teachers. Almost nobody was isolated. Uh, much of it was going in and not only out from the teacher. This was only one of the analyses uh, that we did. We also looked at the relationship between how much people participated and their change in writing test scores. We also did analysis of their uh, syntax and vocabulary and how that developed over the year and how that related to their participation in the blogging. So, you know, as a, as a language and literacy researcher, the fact that so much writing is going on online now is just like heaven. Because if students were having an oral conversation, how would you capture all this? But everything is in writing, so you can really capture it and, and analyze it uh, very beautifully. Which leads us to the next study, which is the one that Keir's involved in, uh, which he'll be presenting on in a couple of weeks, but I'll just uh, briefly introduce here. Uh, Again, actually the same school district in Colorado. Now they're doing all their writing on Google Docs. They're not using Microsoft Word anymore. Well now that allows us to keep track of all the writing that all the students do in the entire year. And I got a, a, small, a small grant to work on this, actually a grant from Google to work on this. And. Uh, I thought, when I got this grant, I thought, great, we're just going to log on to Google Docs and press a couple of buttons and analyze all their writing. Well, I was wrong. So even though, so Google Docs uh, makes their API public, and if you know what API, you know what that is. If you don't, I'm not prepared to explain what that is. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it makes the data from Google Docs public. Which means a couple things. It's possible for researcher, but you could also embed Google Docs into other software programs. Uh, but it's not easy or automatic to extract. So for six months, we were partnering with uh, Professor Judy Olson in ICS and a team of undergraduate students. How many of you majoring in ICS? Just one? <laughs> Okay, well, we were part, they have uh, kind of service learning uh, courses where students work on actual projects, and we have independent studies and this and that. We had a research team that was developing software, and with that software, a web app, we were able to extract, how, how many documents do we have here? I think that's the total. Yeah. Okay, many, many thousands, not the thousands, I'm sure it's scores of thousands of documents written by the students over the year. Uh, and we're, we also have surveys for those students that talk about their attitudes towards writing. And we also have writing test scores from last year and from the end of this year, or the beginning of this year the end of this year. So with all that, we can look at things like how much they write, revise, delete uh, in Google Docs, what kind of collaboration they do in Google Docs, and how that relates to changes in test scores. Uh, we're just at the beginning of that analysis. Uh, you know, this just represented document, um, I don't know, if, I think this was a, a few hundred documents from a couple, a few classes of students that looked at uh, how many words, you know, they added over time, uh, which were, you know, some of the documents they worked on as much as 250 days, but almost all the words were added in the first 50 days. It's just one very, very small graph from the research and we'll have here we'll be presenting a little bit more in a couple of weeks and then hopefully in a few months we'll have some interesting results. Uh, another project, uh, I wouldn't say it's on the back, it, under development, uh, it's been under development for a couple of years is to create some dialogic games for science learning. Uh, the idea is that the misconceptions that people have about science are the same today as they had in the time of the great scientists of the past. So the things that Darwin and Galileo had to deal with in explaining their views are the, dealing with the same misconceptions that, that kids have today when they start learning about the world. So we thought we would develop a historical game where kids would actually go back in the past and dialogue directly with scientists to uh, discuss because the other thing that uh, we know about learning is that 
when you get to express your own thoughts, and that's why writing is very powerful in education, when you express your own thoughts, it's a great learning opportunity. So, uh, by dialoguing with great scientists, and the scientist asks us, uh, ask questions about, you know, what to do and how to do things, kids actually have to type their responses. And then the idea is that kids could do it collaboratively, we could have special, remember the term scaffolding, for English learners and others, we could have scaffolding, such as like, you know, words that might go into their response and things like that. And then the most interesting part of it would be how to provide feedback on what students write, because it would be very, very difficult for every uh, the teacher to have to respond to every student or every group of students. So we were uh, the idea is to develop it with natural language processing which wouldn't be perfect, but could probably figure out about 80% of the time, you know, whether, what the students were saying, and kind of respond and say, yes, great answer, or no, have you thought of this? But in the times that it couldn't figure out, it would know that it couldn't figure out, and then it could either give the students a multiple choice, say, oh, what are you saying, this, this, or this, or it could kick it out to the teacher. And the teacher could be behind the scenes, you know, writing out responses. But instead of writing out responses to every group, to only like 20% of the group. So this is still under development. We, we applied for an NSF grant and got some good feedback and are working on another version. And then uh, I think the last one is uh, Gloria Mark, a professor in ICS, and I have just got a grant to look at multitasking in the millennial generation. Do you know what the term millennial generation is? It's basically people who have come of age in the new millennium, such as you guys. So uh, Gloria has done a lot of research uh, among uh, adult professionals to look at how multitasking affects their performance in the workplace. Uh, when they check email a lot, does that distract them? Does that help them? Da 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 da. da. We're doing a similar research with we're going to do with undergraduates here at UCI and elsewhere. We just got NSF funding for that. Uh, we're going to look at uh, how people multitask, how they use social media. Does social media use help them or hinder their learning? Uh, we're going to do things like have people, you know, pay students to be cut off for one week and not use any digital media, and then record their heart rate to see if it goes <laughs> up and things like that. So it should be an interesting study. So uh, there's my contact information, and stay in touch. Thank you very much.